Well, we, uh, we've got a special guest tonight. It's a podcast we've had lined up for a long time, and uh, this actually had homework. So hopefully, if you, haven't, uh, if you haven't done the homework, head out to the show post for this. It'll be theaverageguy.tv slash HGG228, just the show number. And uh, I'll have the link to, to John's book. But Sir John Hargrave. John, thanks for coming on, and we're excited about uh, kind of going through your book. I'm so excited to be here, but I'm a little nervous because I didn't do the homework. Was I supposed to? Well, you wrote the book, so I, okay. I, I, think, I, I think we are good. Is that maybe the teacher? Is that it? Am I giving the exam? <laughs> you're, you're going to, yes. Finally! So everybody Finally. take out a piece of, pa- a piece of paper, 1 to 10, <laughs> and uh, the quiz will be given by you. John, let's start with this concept of sir. Not everybody gets to be a sir, and obviously there's got to be a story behind that. So maybe start. tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got that title. Yeah, it's kind of a funny story. I wrote The Queen of England a few years ago, and I said, Your Majesty, I would like to be knighted, because I just thought Sir John Hargrave sounded so much classier. Don't you? Yeah, Tim? this sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought it looked good on a monogram, on a pajamas. So they, uh, the Queen wrote me back. She said, I'm sorry, you have to do something noble or honorable. And I was like, well, that's, that's a lot of work. <laughs> so uh, I called up my local county courthouse, and I found out you can go down, pay a small fee, you go before a judge, you can have your name legally changed, and so I, here I am today, Sir John Hargrave, kind of a name hack, if you will. I like it. Well, it's effective. It got me to ask you the question on the uh, on the show, and <laughs> and so tell us a little bit about where you're from, some background, some of those kinds of things. Yeah, so I uh, reside in Boston. I'm the CEO of Media Shower, the content marketing company, and uh, I'm the author of this uh, new book, Mind Hacking, which is all about reprogramming your brain to achieve the impossible. I'm excited to talk about that tonight with uh, with you and your listeners. Yeah, no, very interesting book. Uh, you sent it to me, I don't know, about eight weeks ago. I began reading it. I think one of the things I was most impressed with is it was just really easy and interesting to read. One of the things that, one of the, the styles you brought in is a very tech, uh, kind of a tech-heavy example. You're talking about mind hacking, so that's kind of easy, and your background's in technology, but I appreciate you bringing in a lot of technology examples in what we're doing. Did you have to do a lot of research to get those, or is that stuff pretty much just top of mind for you? Oh, so much research. Yeah, a ton of research. And, I mean, it really is a book for geeks, by geeks. I consider myself a, a great lover of technology. And uh, the research really was on two fronts. One was finding good stories. And, really, it's an ode to all my favorite technology heroes, like, you know, Steve Jobs and Woz and... Uh, Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison, all these great legendary historic geeks. But the other part was all the research. So there's all this neuropsych research that um, we wanted in the book to make sure that uh, it has all the the grounding of science behind it. So between the two, there was a lot of research. Yeah, and so uh, there's a genesis to the book. What was, as we think about, you know, why, what made you sit down and think about this and what was the genesis concept that really got you going on this book? <laughs> yeah, so I tell the story in the first opening chapter, uh, but I was visited by the U.S. Secret Service at my home. And uh, I won't get into the story. I won't spoil the surprise. But, uh, but let's just say that when the Secret Service shows up on your doorstep, it's probably a good sign that things aren't going so well in your life, yeah. right? Yeah. So uh, I realized that alcohol and drugs were at the core of this uh, this problem that led the Secret Service to my, my home. And that night I made a decision to throw away everything, throw away all the alcohol and drugs I had in my house. Most difficult thing I've ever done. And in the process of doing that, I found the most difficult thing was my mind. And any of us who've tried to make a change in our lives, change a habit, get healthier, exercise more, start a business – Uh, spend money more responsibly, stop procrastinating. We all know that our mind is one of the fundamental obstacles to overcome. And so I found if I was able to just concentrate on the muscle movement of throwing these bottles into the dumpster, not like putting my mind on hold and focusing on literally one step at a time, I was able to get through that. And that was my first mind hack, like a technique to control my mind. And over the coming years, uh, as I got and stayed sober, I really worked to develop a library of these ideas, again, grounded by science. And it's that collection of, of hacks 
for your mind to change your behavior, to change your mental programming that, that uh, we list in the book. One of the things that I started practicing as I was reading through the book, and you talked a little bit about concentration or, or uh, kind of listening to what's going on inside your head as, you're, as it's happening, right? Kind of yeah. capturing those thoughts, that programming is what you say. And, and just taking then, taking those steps, and like working out is hard for everybody, right? And, yeah. and I'm, I love to work out, but there are days when I just don't want to. And so I took some steps following what we talked about. It's, it's just not thinking about the workout itself, but grabbing my bag and walking out of my office, right? That was like the yeah. first, like, okay, I'm going to grab my, my, my gym bag, walk out of the office, you know, get in the fitness center, change. That's the next step. And then not think about the total workout, but one, you know, kind of one step at a time. Can you talk a little bit about that process as you think through of just getting started on something? To Yeah, to that's yeah, that's such a beautiful example. I, I love that. And, you know, an even easier step, if that's too much work, is when you get up in the morning, you put on your, your workout clothes. That's it. There's a great book called The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg, and he talks about how to create positive habits. And he says you need a cue and you need a reward. So the cue is the thing that happens to remind you to sort of kick off the habit, and the reward is the thing that you do uh, after the habit. And you do those two things consistently. So just getting up in the morning and putting on your, your sneakers or your workout clothes serves as your cue. It just reminds you throughout the day you're more likely to exercise if you just have it on. And then if you reinforce it with a, with a reward, and that can be something very simple uh, and uh, easy to implement consistently, like a smoothie or coffee or a shower or going to sleep, whatever it is, doing that consistently but withholding it when you don't do your habit I guess you can't really withhold sleep from yourself but you get the idea the right. cue and the reward kind of bookend that habit and really make it stick yeah one of the things I started doing uh, is purchasing uh, ch like chocolate really tasty chocolate protein bars that I actually Excellent. staged at my desk yeah right good. at work so we have a fitness center at work, and so it's easy for me to go downstairs and work out, and that was the reward, right? It's like, okay, and I just have a box. It's easy to buy on Amazon. In fact, I made it really easy to buy them, right, through the one-click type thing, so when I would run out, it would be easy to order more so that I would never run out of those carrots, right? That was one of those kinds of things. So when I'm done, I always have a look forward to, okay, at least when I get back to my office, I've got this reward. Is that what you're talking about when you talk about Brilliant. Reward? Yeah, I'm going to have to use that one. And that's perfect. And then you don't get the energy bars, the, the tasty chocolate treats when you don't exercise. That's the other thing is you can't give yourself the reward uh, if you don't do it, but you are always consistent with giving it to yourself when you do. And it's really powerful. So, so much of what mind hacking is about is just new habits of thought, like providing ourselves with good mental habits that lead to physical actions, like the things you're talking about, like working out more frequently. But it all starts in our mind. Our mind is, is like the, the operating system for our life. So when we can reprogram or hack our mind, the rest of our life, our physical life, will follow. This had me thinking for, I'm a law student going into my final year of law school, and I was always thinking, oh, well, I'm not done yet, but but thank you. I was thinking, you know, over the lunch hour, just like Jim was talking about working out, a lot of times I would go out to my car and listen to podcasts, because that's what I love to do. Yeah. I was like, okay, maybe if I use this whole technique and just walk to the library instead and just sit there, maybe if I just sit there, I might, you know, open up a book and get extra reading done, extra studying done, and it the whole you are not your mind thing was just a very different way that I had never really thought about just looking at the actions I take every day. So it got me thinking, and I, I like that way of just the one step at a time. It was intriguing. Yeah, I appreciate that. And this concept of you are not your mind is really fundamental. That's the first thing we talk about in the book. So you have to learn to develop this awareness of your mind. And the analogy that uh, I like to use is a movie theater. So I'm like a movie geek, and when I go into the movie, at the beginning of the movie, maybe you're like this, you're analyzing the movie, and you're thinking about like the, you know, the cinematography and the music and all that. And, uh, but then if it's a good movie, you get lost in it, right? Like that's the, that's the purpose of a movie is to get lost in it. Forget your boring life for a little while. And so uh, our minds are like that movie where – we get so lost in our minds that when our minds start telling us stuff, we just kind of go along with it, and we forget that we're like not. The, it's kind of a mental movie. 
Another analogy we can use is like being in super user mode. So like, you know, as we all know, you've got kind of your user access in an operating system, and then you've got admin access or super user access. And the admin access has all these like superpowers that a normal user doesn't get. And that's what we want is like to be able to get to sort of that admin level role of our own mind so we can step back for a second and say, wait a minute, here's what's going on in my mind. Like a programmer looks at code and say, all right, I don't like the way this is running. <laughs> I can see there's bugs here and then reprogramming that to make make it better. And these, those are the stories. That is why, so I got through section one. I, I just got to the end of the analyzing section. Mm -hmm. But those are the stories that you, the way you wrote the book, it was such a fun, um, not an easy read because it was intriguing, but almost like it was just, it, it grabbed you and you're like you were in it. Like the whole NASA story at the beginning of the analyzing section. What kind of sparked you to write it in that way with those stories and those explanations instead of just more of a scientific here's the facts sort of book? Yeah, well, I appreciate I appreciate that feedback, Mike. That's really uh, kind. And, you know, my theory is that uh, if you're writing something that is kind of a self-help book, what I didn't want is, uh, like, most self-help books have, like, um, you know, flowers or, like, galloping horses on the cover. <laughs> You know, I didn't want, I did not want a silhouette of the Buddha, did not want that. But I wanted something that, like, would appeal to somebody like me, like a very geeky, you know, technical person, but also have good stories, like be fun to read and enjoyable. So I wanted it to be like a user manual for the mind, but I also wanted it to be a real pleasure to read at the same time. Because we can get very sort of uh, philosophical when we start talking about the mind. It can get very esoteric, and it can sort of lose grounding with like, well, what does this mean for me? And what I really wanted to do was say, here's how you can use these techniques, techniques that are actually proven by science. Here's how you can take this stuff and actually make it work in your life. And here's the exercises that you can take home and do and use it to reprogram your thinking. Well, I'm a huge Apple fanboy, so you had me at Wozniak and the Apple One. So. <laughs> yeah, there's some good, uh, right in. There's some good right jobs in. and Woz stories in there oh, yeah. for sure. John, you use an app in this. It, you know, you kind of, it's a book. Uh, I mean, it's an e-book uh, that you can download. It's actually available for free right now, right? I mean, I can put this link on my site in the show notes. It's still available for free. Folks can just download it and read it. Yeah, that's right. So we're trying an interesting experiment with this. It's going to be published by Simon & Schuster in January 2016, available in bookstores everywhere, and you can pre-order your copy at Amazon now. It's a really beautiful book. But at the same time, we've made uh, the digital version available for free in the spirit of open source software. So you can get that right now at mindhacky.ng. And we'll throw that in the chat room when we do that. No, it's definitely a geek's book. I mean, I think my audience, when, when I started reading this, I thought, oh, my audience is going to love this. They are very geeky when they think about it. When we think about the loop, you know, we're writing code and we think about the loop, what's the role, you kind of talk about concentration and addiction, and, and what's the role those kind of play in when we think about our brains and they're running through these loops? First talk a little bit about the importance of concentration, and then can you bring addiction in there? Because I think a lot of us struggle with that. Yeah. Yeah, so concentration training is uh, probably the most important discipline or habit to get into our, our lives. So we talked about the you are not your mind, the awareness, but then next is concentration training. We call it Jedi training in the book because I think there actually is a lot of similarities between the way we approach it and the way Luke Skywalker learns it uh, in Star Wars. But basically, there's an exercise. You may know it as meditation or mindfulness, but you spend 20 minutes in the morning. Uh, you spend the first few minutes uh, focusing on the breath, and then the rest of the time focusing um, uh, on your breathing at the nostrils and really trying to keep your mind focused, concentrated, just on your breathing. Now, we gamify it. So we say when your mind starts wandering and you notice your mind wandering, because that's the trick, when you notice it wandering, you give yourself a point. So we call them awareness points. And then you just redirect it back to the breath. And you keep track of your points. So you keep score, and then you keep a log or a journal, and there's an app that goes with the program. So basically you keep track of your scores from day to day. And by doing that, by gamifying it, we turn what, you know, in traditional meditation is kind of like a, 
uh, you, you feel badly when you notice that your mind is wandering, but here you get that little dopamine hit, so you get a little burst of pleasure that, oh, I notice my mind is wandering, and now I can bring it back. That's the fundamental skill, because when we notice uh, our mind wandering and bring it back, in that moment we're realizing, okay, I'm not my mind. Again, I'm the programmer of my mind. I'm the developer here. I'm not like in the program. I'm actually outside of it, and I can control it, and it's hard because I don't have much practice at it yet, but as I keep doing it, I learn and I get better and I get more skillful at that. That's what concentration training is all about. And how is that? Uh, certainly, because it's in an app, you guys have some telemetry on what folks are doing. I'm not talking about digging into their information, but uh, how's that going? Are people using that? Are you seeing readers using that with success and keeping track? Because that was, for me, that was a little bit of a challenge. It's like, Oh, I got to get my phone. I got to practice. I'm mean, practicing concentration is hard. Are yeah. you seeing? Do you have any good success stories from folks uh, writing in with you on that? Yeah. So we're using this app called CoachMe, Coach.me, and I'm just a huge fan. So they've basically created a platform which you can use to improve yourself, and you basically join communities of people who are trying to accomplish the same goals, and it's everything from exercise more frequently, to drink more water, to, you know, write a chapter of my novel a day. And uh, so our whole platform is based on this app. And they give you a lot of data and insight into what the community is doing. Um, and it's been really rewarding to watch the uptake from all of our mind hackers, this community that's growing uh, bigger every day. But it's also really great because you can give each other shout outs and you can, you know, sort of high five other members of the community. So you've got this built in, um, you know, group of people who are all trying to uh, accomplish this goal of learning mind hacking together. So it's awesome. Yeah, it was, for me, it's been a hard part. I need to revisit that. I got in, I got signed up. I, I need to revisit and, and kind of practice it again because it was one of those things I got and then it was gone, you know, and, and it's definitely not, I, I get the, as I read through the rest of the book, I got this feeling, it's not really a one and done, right? This is a book really okay. written, it's a manual kind of, of things to keep going with, right? Yeah, so it's a 21-day program, uh, which we have laid out at the end of the book, and the app walks you through that 21-day program. But at the same time, uh, you know, it is a uh, mastering our mind is, is a challenge that, that lasts a lifetime. It's a little bit like learning programming. Like you can probably learn the fundamentals of a language in 21 days and gain proficiency with it and enough to start working on some serious projects. But to really become a master, you know, it takes uh, ongoing practice. But at least you have that structure to get you started and to keep you motivated to get through that initial learning curve, the most difficult part of, of, uh, of learning anything new. Did you, as you were working through the book, what kind of journey was this for you? I mean, did, did it affect you personally? Did you come out the backside different than you were coming in the front side before you started the book? Yeah, totally. I really did. I mean, I, it, when you write a book like this, uh, you come, you know, the best way to learn something is to teach it to someone else. And if you're writing a book about it, you have to go so deeply into it that, you know, when you come out, you have a much broader understanding uh, of, of this than when you started. So, yeah, absolutely. And I feel for me it was kind of, you know, uh, <laughs> like finishing the last few chapters of the book, I read this great essay by uh, Nikola Tesla, which was, uh, I think it was called uh, Harnessing the Human Energy Field. And it was this huge... Uh, essay that he wrote for this monthly magazine uh, toward the end of his life. And it was about all the things that he wanted to still do and invent to improve humanity. And it was so inspiring. And I really, you know, I felt like there's another whole book just in that. So that's the kind of book kind of ends uh, at, at this magnificent essay that he wrote and some of the concepts that he explored in there. But I think that's the next chapter for, for the next book. No, good. You're already building in a sequel. Uh, Michael Ray asked out in chat, how well would this work with folks that have ADHD and focus problems? Do you think? Yeah, very well. Very well. So there's a, a lot in the book about um, ADHD and about training concentration. And I think that lack of focus is one of the great issues of our time. And especially for those of us who um, are geeks and live a digital lifestyle, 
we are inundated with distractions. So that's your Skype chat requests, your instant messages, your text messages, all the email lists that you're on, and so forth. And all the research shows that multitasking is a myth. Um, the, every, every task you add to your already overloaded cognitive processes means you do every one of those tasks worse. And so a lot of what we recommend in the book is consciously crafting a lifestyle to simplify those digital distractions. So in other words, turning off your Skype chat request and you know setting your uh, messages to vibrate and unsubscribing from email lists. We call it the one hour investment, taking an hour to just shut down as many of those things as possible permanently. And all the research shows that when you do that, you're able to focus larger blocks of time on the things that really matter, on actually getting deep uh, focus into specific tasks that you need to get done without this kind of constant bombardment of interruptions that cause that rapid task switching that, uh, that certainly exacerbate your ADHD. Can I use that word, exacerbate? I don't want to uh, offend no, you. You're, yeah. <laughs> you're good. Yeah. No, you know, I, I, um, we got a really busy weekend and week coming up. I'm preparing for a whole long week summit that we're having at work and got a lot of stuff going on, a lot of things coming in. And this this week, it was funny, um, on our Facebook group, I somebody was talking about the myth of multitasking or that you could do it. And I had written in there, you know, the same thing you said, multitasking is a myth, right? Mm -hmm. And yet one of the days, I think it was just yesterday, I was just getting hammered with <laughs> Facebook and Twitter. I was, social media is part of my job. And so it was coming in and I was getting phone calls and people were hitting me. And I had that moment where I was, I mean, I had to stop for a second and just like take a couple deep breaths and be like, I have absolutely, I'm overrunning the CPU at this point. I'm, I mean, physically yeah. I'm taking it on. And there was some moments I, I, I kind of went back to the concentration exercises here to think, okay, let's, for a second, let's just try and block some things out, take some deep breaths, and let's let's pull this thing back together. And you're right, uh, the more you have coming in, the less you do. And I think a, a perfect example, I think we, we face all of that, you know, all those problems going in. And so there's some great helps in there, I think, uh, even in that first chapter of how to kind of overcome some of those and to come back to concentration, right? Because we have, we just get inundated with everything that's out there. One more question on the book, because I really want people to go out and dig into it, and I don't want to give away all the good stuff. There's tons. We haven't even talked about the good questions of Chapter 2 that are in there that, that, uh, that I went through question by question. And it's funny, in the book you say, write it down. I'll wait. <laughs> and it's and I'm like, oh, I actually have to get a pen and a piece of paper, you know, and write things down. It's but, hard, right? It's hard to go find a pen and paper and write things down. Well, and I did. I got my book out and I, I started. But it was it was one of those encouraging things to me. I was like, oh, he actually wants me to. Because sometimes you read books and you're just reading them to just get through them, right? And you're like, go oh, right. I'll wait for you. And uh, and so that was a good good encouragement to do that. One last, one last question, though, I alluded to up front. When we think about addiction, you talked about that brain cycle of when you were trying to get rid of those bad habits and you were yeah. dumping things out. When we think about the programming of our mind, how does addiction play into that programming? I mean, what is that component that just keeps it going over and over and over and over again? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a deep question. There's a lot of good stories about addiction in the book. And one of my favorite stories is, um, is about this book that was written uh, about 100 years ago called The Common Sense of Drinking. And this was the book that predated Alcoholics Anonymous and 12-step groups, and it was one of the first uh, guys, uh, Dr. William Peabody, who really tried to create a program to help alcoholics. And uh, I read this book as I was getting sober. It was a big help to me. And one of the things he said was every morning, the, uh, the recovering alcoholic should write down uh, a list of everything that he or she is going to do that day, including rest. Like if you're going to take a nap, you write it down on your, on your list. And then uh, at the end of the day, you cross off everything on the list that you actually accomplished. So make a to-do list and then cross it off. Now, 
that seems kind of simple and obvious, but what it did was the alcoholics were in this negative loop. The negative loop was one of like, I feel terrible about myself, so I'm going to drink, and then I'm going to get drunk, and then I'm going to black out, I'm going to pass out, and then in the morning I'm going to wake up, and I'm going to feel terrible, and that's going to make me even feel more terrible about myself. So this is a negative loop constantly going on. And what he's doing is turning it into a positive loop. So it's like, okay, look at all these things that I wanted to do today actually positive and constructive in some way, including taking the nap, and then I cross them off at the end of the day. So it turns it now into this positive beneficial loop. Now he's also got all these other things going on, and he's got a lot of the mind hacks that we talk about in the book, uh, and so there's, there's habits of positive thought going on, you're helping other people, so that's habits of positive action. So it's reinforced by a lot of these other things, but the basic concept is that you're trying to turn this negative spiral back backwards and start to get it going in the positive direction and then gain momentum. So it's like a snowball or like a flywheel where you're getting more and more of that energy put back into your mind and into your life. And it works. It really works. That's what happened to me. And I mean, that happens to countless uh, addicts and, and alcoholics once they get sober. Yeah, and Lopta says in chat, not just a loop, but a spiral. You mentioned that here just a yeah. second ago. They're a little bit, but either a downward or an up, upward spiral on that. That's um, right. It, uh, Jason, no. Let's see. Ray asked the question, so do you suggest scheduling email check uh, phases at work? In other words, specific times to check email and the schedule so that you're focusing on one thing at a time. And I know you got a bunch of tips in the book to do that, yeah. but is that is that one of those things that uh, you recommend? Yeah, I'm a big fan of that. I find it personally more helpful to schedule blocks of solid work. So in other words, schedule times of like, I'm going to accomplish this thing over this hour. Um, I, I believe in uh, this technique called three mit, three most important things. I didn't invent it, but I find it useful. In the morning, you get in in the morning, you uh, write down the three most important things, the things that are really going to drive your business or your life forward the ones that will really make the biggest difference. And then you do those three things first before you like check off all the busy work, like answering email and checking social media. Um, and then you use your social media and your email and all that kind of easier work as a reward for getting one of the hard things done. So that's how it works better for me is schedule the block of time, clearly define what that hard piece of work is, get it done without distractions, and then go in and allow yourself time to just answer emails or whatever. Yeah, that's, no, that's good. The, guys, the book is free right now. I, put the, I have the link in the, in the chat room as well as on uh, the show notes for this. You should be down. I mean, there's lots of great tips in there uh, when we think about some of these things that we've been talking about here on the program. And So, so guys, dig, uh, dig deep into that. John, I want to talk a little bit about the writing process, and not from a how did you write it, but the technology that you used. A little bit, you're, you, you alluded to this in the beginning, but I want to dive in deep. If I'm an aspiring author, I'm thinking about writing a book. Everybody, I think, has a book in them. Don't you think that, that everybody's yeah. got a book in them? Yeah, so at least book, one. At least one book, and I think I even got one. But... Um, what did you use as you as you approach this from a technology standpoint? How did you go about actually writing the book using technology? Well, we really wanted to make this uh, fun for developers, and you know the the geeks out there, your audience, you listening, um, you're you're who I wrote this book for, and really what I wanted to do was put this on a platform that kind of nodded to the open source movement and to just the development process in general. So let me tell you the normal publishing process first, and then I'll tell you what we did. So here's how it normally works. You get a book deal, you write your book, you send it in to your editor who gives you some feedback, you send it out to like a dozen family and friends, and they all tell you it's great because they're your family and friends, and then you make some edits, and then it goes to press, and then it's released to the world. So what we did instead was made it uh, on this platform called Gitbook, which is kind of built on the principles of Git and GitHub. Uh, so it's a giant platform that anybody can use that made it free, and then we opened, uh, we released it under a Creative Commons license. And we opened it to the world. And I will never go back to the old way of doing it again because what it let us do was have thousands of people come in and read the book. 
and give us feedback and go through the program and tell us what worked and what didn't, just like software. So it really let us iterate and improve the whole process, but it also let me see what parts of the book were working or what weren't what, what, what working. I rewrote the intro like five times, constantly kind of A-B testing it. And you never would be able to do that with the traditional process. So I think Gitbook and these collaborative types of writing platforms uh, like Medium and like um, Amazon Write-On and things like that are the future of publishing. And the great part is you don't need a book deal. You can get started today. Yeah, it really allows you to iterate in the process. A lot to ask, uh, is it available on EPUB? Yeah, so the other thing that I just love about Gitbook, it's such a great platform, is super easy to use, like a great rich text editor, uh, and then you can easily just publish it to uh, a website, to uh, you know, EPUB, Mobi, all the you know electronic book formats, uh, as well as PDF. So all that comes built in, and it's totally free. So it's just such a great platform. So is it really free in the sense like so? Can anyone kind of step in, have an idea, start working on a book this way, and there's really no cost to get getting started on the platform and submitting yeah. documents in there? Yeah. Currently, totally free. And how big is that community? From a, you know, it's it takes a community of folks to get in, and so have give some general numbers when you when your book was reviewed. How many people do you think actually reviewed it? Uh, oh, you mean our community for the book, yeah. or the whole yeah. whole get, uh, get book? Maybe both, if you know numbers for both. If you yeah, I don't know get book. I've spoken with the founders there, and they are uh, just super two really great guys, so passionate about like building this product and and listening to customers. So uh, I'm a I'm a big fan. Uh, Sammy and Aaron are the are the guys behind get book. But for ours, I think we've had like twenty thousand reads so far, something along those lines. And uh, again, that that is kind of beta testing before we release it has just made the book so much better than it would have been, you know, if it was just my editor and my my mom reading it. Yeah, your family, friends. How did, how did, oh, go ahead, Mike. Oh, Mike, you're muted, man. Sorry, that's why we couldn't hear you. <laughs> there, my dog was barking. In the oh, that's so, okay. There you go. Go ahead. Um, so when you release a book this way, I've kind of watched some people do book releases in the past, and there's a huge focus on, you know, when it's on Amazon, trying to get as many sales in a certain time frame for, you know, number one bestseller or getting number one in certain categories. Do you think doing this pre-release for free will help that because you've already got this this audience that wants to that was to support you and help and they want that book or like is that not even a worry anymore do you are you not focused on the on those stats well we would like the book to sell well and it needs to sell well in order for traditional publishers to be interested in taking my next book so that's always you know <laughs> a, a big concern um, however I have seen what you mentioned which is authors trying to kind of game the Amazon algorithm to try to like hit the bestseller list in the first 48 hours and I don't think that works very well and I also don't think it's very good for building an audience or for helping people so part of what we want to do is get this out to as many people as possible right and uh, the author Cory Doctorow uh, has also made a lot of his books free um, and or available under Creative Commons licenses in addition to being published. And he had this great quote where he said, I'm not interested in, I'm, I'm more interested in getting the, the maximum number of people under the tent more than I am interested in making sure everybody under the tent has paid for a ticket. <laughs> so in other words, like you want to expand the audience and, and what I want to do is share this with as many people as possible. In the mean, you know, as part of that, we have to sell books, but also I'm fine with giving it away for free because I do believe in the end that good karma will come back. You know, people will hear about it on your show, they'll love it, they'll go tell family and friends, and they'll buy a copy for, you know, they'll put it on their wish list and, and they'll order a pre release, and that will drive uh, Amazon book sales as well. I agree. I really liked, it was a different way. You're the first person I've heard of that's kind of done it this way. So I kind of like it. And I like the idea of the good karma thing. Cause I think that's so true. You helping people and the tent analogy is perfect. I'm going to use that in the future. I like it. Yeah. I, I, it's all, this is an experiment. <laughs> Nobody knows, but I got to give credit to my publishers, uh, Simon and Schuster. They've been so open to exploring 
these new models. I mean, we all know that publishing is undergoing huge changes, and, and we do have to find models that work better, not just for, for us as readers, but also for the companies that, uh, that, <laughs> that publish books, because it does take a lot of time and energy and money to put out a good quality product, which they've definitely done here. John, did you try the, did you use the method where you released a chapter at a time and let people uh, read those and give you feedback, or was it all at once? Uh, I think it was, it was in sections, if I recall. Okay. So in sections, but pretty quickly staged after each other, because I wanted to make sure I had kind of coherent right. sections Right. Before I put it up, but things like Amazon Ride On and those kind of models are are they they encourage you to do more a chapter at a time. Yeah, and when did you start putting putting stuff out there? Uh, you know, it's going to release here in in 2016. When was it first available? I want to say a year ago, but you could oh. go check the the Git version history. Okay, so it's been out it's been out quite a while. Uh, from that, from a from a available to the public standpoint. Yeah, but again, I mean, the first draft yeah. was was very rough, yeah. and so it's been continually modified and and refined over time. As an author, how easy is it to get that feedback and not be defensive? I mean, we know on Facebook <laughs> when someone types in all caps or the trolls, you know, say things about that. As an author, how easy was that to get that feedback? Uh, I'll tell you a funny story. So we've we've done a lot of this pre-release publicity, and one of the first things we did was uh, went out to Goodreads, uh, you know, the big uh, the big reader community, and we found people who we thought might be interested, like they liked similar books, and uh, and we asked them if they you know preview a, a copy of the book for free. And the first review we got on Goodreads was outstanding. It was five stars. It was just it was great. I was I was so happy, and this. <laughs> The second one was two stars, and it just said, not for me. <laughs> two stars. Who gives a book two stars? Like, Mein Kampf, I don't think I would give that two stars. I mean, <laughs> so there was still literary merit to it. Anyway, the whole thing was like, really, two stars. I don't think, though, as an author, that you can get too hung up on any one review, despite me ranting about that one. So you try to take things as a whole, and that was what also was useful about the Git model was, just like developing software, you know, one user complaining about a bug, you can take it or leave it, but if you hear a lot of users saying the same thing, then you're like, okay, that's, that's a, an issue that needs addressing. And so we tried to apply that software model to the book. Yeah, no, very cool. Um, I can had asked in chat, uh, thoughts on an audio version? We're an audio podcast, and a lot of our guys listen to all their stuff via audio. Have you, uh, have you worked through an audio part yet, or will Simon Schuster take care of that for you? I think Simon Schuster will take care of that, but yeah, um, I appreciate hearing the, uh, the, uh, the demand for that because uh, I, I'm very excited about doing the audio version, and yeah. uh, I hope that comes to pass. John, I'm not going to lie. You could kill it with a podcast over this book. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. No, you absolutely could. A regular a regular community built around the book where you come out. I mean, the Freakonomics guys did this. and have Yeah, been that's very, a great podcast. Yeah, been very, very successful. I think there's so much good material in here, written so well and, and constructed so well. Just as I read through it, for me, it was just really simple to follow where you were going. The things made sense. You didn't talk too long on, on, you know, on the pieces. It wasn't all about you. It was about us reading the book. And I just think, as you, you know, you've started in the open source community. I really, I man, I really think you, you could do a podcast. Have you, have you done any regular podcasting in, in your background at all? Well, I've done an awful lot of podcasts to promote the book, yeah, even I though it's not have. out yet. I bet you have. <laughs> it's been this year-long promotion effort. Uh, are you but sick I of really talking to us at this point? Is that does it get a no, little? Not at all. No, this okay, is a great good. one. No, no, good. no. You guys are good. You're good. It's going good. Good. Um, but uh, but I've really enjoyed doing those because you there is it's it's very different from doing TV and radio where you come in and you have three minutes and you've got to be very soundbitey and you know the hosts are always trying to be funny and clever at the same time. But the beauty of podcasts is it's this just very organic communication medium where you can have these longer form conversations and get more deeply into ideas and do things like take questions from from your audience. So I, I think it's terrific and uh, I'd be open to doing a podcast. I think it'd be cool to do the concentration exercises on a regular basis 
as a podcast, like with uh, with celebrity guests. That would be fun. Yeah, have you, have you heard about that 25 minute in the zone model for developers? You know, for software developers, where they they get they they concentrate for 25 minutes at a time, write code, and then you take a break, 10 minute break, do something different. And there's even music that's developed. Have you heard of that concept at all? Because I think that plays in nicely with your concentration. In other words, doing work like email, 25 minutes, set the clock, boom, go, you know, go like crazy for 25 minutes, get in the zone, and then get out. Type thing. Have you heard of that uh, that technique? I have not. I'll check that out. But it is very similar to what we're talking about. It's yeah. like you set aside a, a block of time to di to dive deep and to get into that flow. And we talk about that concept of flow. And we all know what flow feels like. It's when things are just going effortlessly and you lose yourself in the work. And programmers or developers know it really well. I think probably better than anyone because when you're like eight levels deep in your code. That you are in that zone. You're in, <laughs> you're in the flow. And if somebody like taps you on the shoulder and says, "Hey, you want to go out for lunch?" You're like, the whole like house of cards just falls down, right? And you know it's going to take you 20 minutes to get back into it. So that's that's what we want to achieve is that that state, that zone. Mike, uh, any last thoughts as we kind of bring this in for landing? Well, where I thought you were going with uh, what he should be doing, I would love to hear him read the audiobook. Like, I think a lot of times there's some authors that I don't think it would be a good idea for them to do the audiobook. I'm like, you know, you're a writer. That's kind of what you should stick to. But hearing you on this show has just been like, I would love to hear your – because the way the book is written, especially just the way that it flows is so you and so unique that I think you would be the best person to read that book. So if they give you the opportunity, man, I would – that would be amazing because I am the guy. Uh, I have an Audible subscription, and you know, yeah. just being in school and stuff, I don't read books at all for fun. I listen to them. So my wife and I will grab a book, and we travel all the time, and we listen to audiobooks. That's all we do. I would love to hear you read it. That would be fun. Thanks, but I'd like to read it in a very high falsetto. <laughs> would that be okay with you, Mike? The Certain, whole book? Certainly. Like this? The whole book, yeah. Chapter <laughs> one. <laughs> As long as it's it, because you're Sir, so it'd be in a British accent. Yeah, the old, the old English lady. Just British, <laughs> British falsetto. That's Welcome good, to my John. attacking arm, Sir John Hargrave. Uh, that's good. <laughs> Nicely, you thought this you through. You practiced that, yeah. No you kidding. thought it through. I like it's, it. It's disturbing. Well, I would, uh, I'd, I'd really encourage you. I think, uh, you know, two podcasts a month where you bring in, you know, talk about elements of the book and then bring in your bring in your audience to who have great examples of you know like my my workout example uh, just using that in that would be a great interview for you to do bring in and support to support the book and, yeah uh, and just put a podcast around the book I'm you know with podcasting I'm like a kid with a hammer you know everything looks like a nail and so <laughs> I think everybody should have a podcast but uh, John thanks for taking the time did we miss anything in here you wanted to highlight that I maybe not a, I didn't ask the question already you guys did a great job, and I just want to tell everybody out there listening, these guys, they put so much work into this podcast, and you get it for free, for free, and it takes a lot of effort and a lot of time to put these together, so you should tell a few people about this, you should rate them, you should subscribe, you should like it, you should share it with some friends, you should tattoo the URL on your forehead, if you, if you like it that much. You I'm should. gonna totally take that bit and clamor it. Have you heard of clamor? Are you familiar with the 18-second clips that you that this all they do is play these clamors over and over again? But John, thanks for saying that. I almost never asked for those, but uh, Mike and I were just joking about that earlier off off uh, in the pre-show about the likes and the all that other stuff. But thanks for coming on. Can we follow up with you? Like, would it be good to follow up in the spring after the book has come out and just kind of catch up and see how things are going and yeah. that kind of stuff? Would that yeah, be okay? I'd love to chat with you guys after the book drops. That yeah. would be a lot of fun. Yeah, this has, been, be this fun. has been great. Good. Well, hey, I appreciate it. Mike and I, thanks for coming on. Again, I'll put the, sh I'll put the link to the book in the show notes. You can pre-order it on, on Amazon right now, right? If you'd like to do that, I can go out there and, and uh, pull that up and pre-order it. I think worth worth having on your shelf. I like that. I read it on my iPhone, so I downloaded the what Mike. What's the version I need for the iPhone? I I don't even know what Uyghur. What what what, what, what is it? EPUB or what? What did I download I to think, make it? Uh, I just do the PDFs. That's what makes oh, it easy for me. Or, or I, I just do it in the web browser. Actually, it, that was my. That's the way I did it. Tons of so, different ways to do it. It worked yeah. on my iPhone. You can go to PDF. You can all those different versions are available for you. 
And so no excuse. John, thanks for coming on. We'll let you drop. And uh, thanks for staying up late for us and uh, doing the podcast. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, guys.